Welcome everyone. I am Mochtaba Pashani, coordinator of the literatures of annihilation, exile, and resistance event series at the University of Notre Dame. As you can see, we are in Zoom meeting mode, which means you are free to keep your cameras on. Please do so if you are comfortable. It's wonderful for our speakers to be able to see their audience. Although I know we are all located in different geographies here, this event is hosted by the University of Notre Dame which I would like to acknowledge is situated on the traditional homelands of indigenous people, including the Oheno-Shenigo, Mayame, Peoria, and particularly the Pokagon and Potawatomi, who have been using this land for thousands of years and continue to do so. We recognize our own place in the history and practices of colonialism and understand that our responsibilities extend beyond this gesture of land acknowledgement. You must also reflect on the University of Notre Dame past, present, and future relationship with the original stores of this land and actively pursue ways to amend this troubled relationship. Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance is an interdisciplinary research collective and lecture series focused on questions of human rights and the arts in the global Middle East, Southeast Asia, and North Africa. Launched by Azarin van der Villiet Ulumi, it is co-sponsored by the College of Arts and Letters and the Clark Institute for International Peace Studies and housed at the Initiative on Race and Resilience directed by Mark Sanders, Professor of English and African Studies. We have a new website at leadsofexile.nd.edu, including an interactive map that traces the migration routes of all our guests. Please visit the site to explore our archives of events, written interviews, and more. I would like to thank our partners. The event is presented in partnership with uh, Kebokian Center for Near Eastern Studies at NYU. We are also partnered with the Transnational Literature Series at Brookline Book Booksmith. And I want to thank them for their collaboration with us and encourage you to purchase our guest books through Brookline Booksmith. Feel free to make your purchases anytime throughout the event. This afternoon, our guests are Joanna Haji Thomas, Khalil Jurek, Alison Rice, and Amir al -Kale. The conversation will be moderated by Hannah Morgenstern. I will read an introduction for each guest shortly. There will be time at the end of the event for Q&A, so please at any time feel free to leave your question in the chat and we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A period, during which you will also be invited to raise your hand. Joanna Haji Thomas and Khalil Jurek are a duo of artists and filmmakers whose work create thematic and formal links between photography, video performance, installation, sculpture, and cinema, documentary or fiction film. The latest film, uh, Memory Box 2021, has been selected for the Berlinale and was released in more than 40 countries. The film also includes Is Myrna 2016, The Lebanese Rocket Society 2012, Jovovoir 2008, and Perfect Day 2005. Several film retrospectives have been presented in renowned institutions such as the Heritage Seminar, New York, Torino Film Festival, International Film Festival for Gijon, Spain, Harvard Film Archive, Cambridge, Lincoln Center, New York, Local International Film Festival, Switzerland, MoMA, New York, Paris Cinema, Tate Modern, London, Vision de Réal, Neon, and uh, La Rochelle, uh, France. As for their art practice, Joanna Haji Thomas and Khalil Jorik have been awarded several prizes, including the Marcel Duchamp Prize in 2017 for their project on conformities. They have been exhibited in numerous museums and their artwork are part of many important public and private collections such as the Centre Pompidou, Jeux de Pomme, or the Cannes Munich, the V&A Museum, British Museum and Whitechapel Gallery the Guggenheim, MIT Boston, the Hamburger Bahnhof, the Charger Art Foundation, and Homebox Forum Beirut, as well as many Vienna's, including Istanbul, Lyon, Charger, Kochi, Guangzhou, Yinchuan, Venice, and Taipei. Professor Rice specializes in 20th and 21th century Francophone literature. Her first book, Time Signatures, Contextualizing Contemporary Francophone Autobiographical Writing from the Maghreb, Lexington Books 2006, uh, closely examined the work of Helen Sikas, Aisha Jabbar, and Abdel Kabir Khatibi. Her second book, book, Polographies, Francophone Women Writing, Algeria, University of Virginia Press 2012, focuses on 
autobiographical writing by seven prominent Francophone women writers from Algeria. She is the editor of a recent volume titled Transpositions, Migration, Translation, Music, Liverpool University Press 2021, that explores a wide range of innovation in Francophone film, literature, theater, and art. Her third book, Worldwide Women Writers in Paris, Francophone Metronomes, Oxford University Press 2021, constitutes an in-depth examination of the present proliferation of women writers of French from around the world. The book is accompanied by a website, francophonemetronomes.com, that features film interviews Addison conducted in Paris with 18 authors, including Ethel Adnan. Poet, novelist, translator, critic, and scholar, Amir Akhali, teaches at Queen's College and the Graduate Center CUNY. His book include After Jews and Arabs, Memories of Our Future, Islanders, Neither Wheat Nor Gold, From Then, From the Warring Faction, and Little History. Recent books include the co-edited A Dove in Flight, poems by Faraj Bayraktar with Sharia Talagani and the New York Translation Collective, a poem sequence, Ghost Talk, and a biography for After Jews and Arabs. He has written and been active on the question of Palestine for decades, and during the wars in ex Yugoslavia, he was one of the main conduits for translation from Bosnia. He is a contributing editor of the Marquez Review and was given a 2017 American Book Award from the Before Columbus Foundation for his work as founder and general editor of Lost and Found, the CUNY Politics Document Initiative. This conversation will be moderated by a scholar, writer, translator, Hannah Morgenstern. Morgenstern is Associate Professor in Postcolonial and Middle East Literature at the University of Cambridge and a fellow at New Hanham College. She is co-director of the Revolutionary Papers Project, co-convener of the Archives of the Disappeared and Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance Research Seminar, and convener of the Postcolonial Paper at the Faculty of English, University of Cambridge. She is currently at work on a book manuscript titled Cultural Resistance in Palestine, Israel, Collaboration Under Colonialism. It is my pleasure to invite Hannah Morgenstern to begin this event. Thank you so much. Um, thank you much, Taba. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited and happy to be here with uh, Alison, Amiel, Khalil, and Joanna. Um, to celebrate and remember the life and work of Etel Adnan. I um, would like to begin just by asking um, the contributors to talk a little bit about how they knew Etel um, and um, anything that you'd like to share about, you know, how, how, you, how you knew and were connected to her and her work. Uh, Amiel, would you like to begin? Sure. Um... I, I was when we went through this in a rehearsal. I was trying to actually pinpoint when I met Atel, and I, I think I confused it. Uh, I probably think that I must have met Atel through dear old friends Kamal Bulata and Lily Farhoud, and I think that would be sometime in the 1980s. Um, and I do have a memory of having the anthology of Walter Lowenfels uh, poems against the Vietnam War in which Atel was in. And I remember her name sticking with me and following up uh, and reading her work in the 70s. And then uh, we just became very dear friends. And you know, one of the things, one of the themes in her that I'll talk about is how we always lamented never living anywhere near each other. And you know, so, I think that's a common theme uh, running through many of Atel's friendships, uh, that they were long distance. So um, that's, that's yeah, that, that, that is, uh, and going to the West Coast almost yearly for some time, we would see each other. And when they were in New York, one way or another, we would find a way to be on the phone or correspond or somehow be in touch. Thanks, uh, Joanna and Khalid. Sorry. Uh, hello, I met Etel in, 
Hello, everyone. I met her before Joanna. I met her in the 90s in San Francisco. We were there presenting a film. End of the 90s, 99. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and uh, it was our first feature film. I knew Etel and Simon by reputation, but we were, but it was the first person in encounter. And then in in 2000, uh, I met uh, Etel uh, in, uh, and Simon uh, in, in a cafe in Beirut. It's a common friend who uh, reunites us. And uh, it was a very uh, beautiful moment because we immediately felt close. We had a common and shared uh, history uh, that we will talk maybe later about. And uh, so uh, we, uh, it, it was uh, like Amiel, I think it was a very fast, it very quickly, it became a close friend, uh, a member of the family and, uh, and we, we stayed very, very close to each other for all those years. Thanks, Alison. Yes, um, I met her later. It was 2005 and I was living in Paris, uh, but just leaving uh, to come to a position here at the University of Notre Dame and uh, wished to conduct a filmed interview with Etel and she welcomed me and my cameraman into, our, into her home uh, right there in the heart of Paris. And we spent several hours that afternoon with her and uh, just had a very memorable moment. And then she maintained contact and was very impressive in that manner, sending me books, sending me things, um, keeping in touch uh, through correspondence. And uh, it was very touching to me that she did so. It just just embodied the generosity that she had shown on that occasion. And we never did see each other again, but we kept in touch uh, over the years. And so uh, very much in resonance uh, with Amiel's comments, uh, we didn't uh, see each other in person, but uh, I felt nonetheless uh, very close to her. And uh, it was remarkable how she did that. Okay, thanks everyone. So I think now we're gonna move on to, um, uh, contributions, presentations um, by each one of the participants. And after that, we'll just um, do some uh, question and answers, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up to audience participation. Uh, so uh, we'll begin with Allison. Okay, I'm happy to share my screen. I hope that you all can see it without uh, issue. We'll go into slideshow mode here. And uh, I am just delighted to have this opportunity to speak uh, alongside these wonderful <laughs> presenters. And I am not uh, as much of an expert of, on Etel Adnan as I would like to be, but have a number of impressions I'd love to share uh, with respect to Etel Adnan. When I saw that we were calling this Images of Etel Adnan, that seemed such an appropriate title for this session to me. Um, because of so many images that she has created uh, in so many forms of art, including literature and uh, comments on music, but of course her artwork uh, itself. And uh, I would love to share just impressions I have uh, related to her. As I mentioned, I came to her work uh, uh, in 2005, so I was, you know, uh, not familiar with it prior to that, but was very impressed with uh, her written work, uh, with her reputation as a poet, and uh, was uh, working on the t at the time on a problematic of writing in the language, uh, writing in languages that are not native tongues, and was uh, conducting interviews with a number of women writers from around the world. Um, uh, who were living and writing in uh, in French, we might say. And so uh, writing in a foreign language is a text uh, that I've found quite beautiful uh, by Etel with wonderful um, uh, thoughts uh, expressed here and uh, uh, found that this resonated with what she said during our interview as well, that her writing um, was influenced and even grew on the very soil uh, that she was inhabiting uh, at the time. 
time. So she would comment on changing mindsets in a sense, changing languages as soon as, as, soon as she got in a plane headed for a new direction, uh, a new place. Um, and she asks in this text, uh, do I feel like I'm in exile? Yes, it is the case, um, but this goes way back. Um, it has lasted so long that it has become my nature. And I cannot say that I have suffered too much from it. Um, there are even moments in which I am happy uh, on page 30 of this text. Uh, and then the third quotation from this text at the bottom of your page here, the century, our, our time period has taught us uh, uh, too often to remain alone, uh, to cut ties, uh, to not look behind, uh, to take off and uh, conquer the moon, that is what I've done, that is what I continue to do, in a sense, is what this text is saying. Um, here are a couple of just snapshots from the interview that she um, so generously uh, uh, accorded me when I asked, uh, and I was a stranger to her, and uh, came and sat in her apartment with her, and, uh, and was just fascinated with so many of her comments, uh, as they were so poetic, uh, so philosophical, and also uh, so laden with um, common sense in, in a beautiful Beautiful way. Um, she was speaking about Western culture and uh, how we have grown up with the principle of non-contradiction. And we were speaking in French, but these subtitles are from an English translation. Um, uh, but something cannot be uh, white and black at once or the thoughts that we often encounter that she was explaining. And then she says, this is false. Um, one can be two things or a thousand things at once. And I hope even in these screenshots that you can see how dynamic, uh, how alive, how, uh, how vivid she is uh, as we're speaking together. It was uh, really something that struck me. And so I created a website and she's featured on this website with the entire um, uh, interview in its uh, edited form. And here the two of us are uh, posing together for a photo. I was very interested in, as I I mentioned in language, so I asked her uh, about her relationship to the multiple languages uh, with which she uh, has been familiar and worked with in various ways, lived with, um, and she responded to my question by saying, I'm not deeply proud of any language because my languages are borrowed. Uh, but I use them the way a musician uses sounds. And often she would have recourse in her written and oral comments to musical uh, points, so musical metaphors, uh, musical uh, um, uh, interesting comments. And, uh, and I found this just uh, fascinating. Um, language for me is a tool like sound for a musician or colors for a painter. And of course, uh, we know how uh, how much of a painter she is, and, and this makes so much sense. And the painter doesn't have a problem if he uses colors that don't speak French. Uh, um, so I really wanted today to kind of highlight some of these comments that she made uh, about painting, about language, uh, uh, and uh, you know various comparisons of sorts uh, that emerged. Um, this is from uh, something entirely different uh, uh, from a video I found online and they abound, of course, uh, various uh, short films uh, um, uh, when she was exhibiting her work, for instance, uh, in San Francisco, they made some beautiful short films uh, with interviews and, and featuring her work. Um, and so here we have uh, her uh, giving testimony to she gave me a corner and she gave me pastels and we see uh, what became of that moment where she was given uh, a corner and pastels to work with. Um, here we have writing is drawing, drawing is writing. This is the voiceover of Etel Adnan speaking and we see what's featured. Uh, this work, um, very compelling here, and then uh, uh, something similar, because it's the same gesture, they're close already. So I, I loved these sort of moments uh, uh, in her own discourse, uh, uh, where she's bringing various art forms together, the writing and uh, the painting, <laughs> etc. 
Um, yes, and so here she's uh, engaging in an, with another interlocutor on uh, on uh, the topic of abstract art and how it works, and then uh, of course um, uh, 3D and and really fascinating questions and and just great great comments. Um, this is another uh, interview, uh, quite a lengthy one, um, when she is uh, engaging in a number of topics, and um, and uh, here we see uh, this is. Not not her own artwork, but that of Simone accompanying uh, the words of Etel uh, Adnan. And this is the book from which uh, those words and that image uh, come. And, uh, and you know, beautiful uh, statements uh, about writing and painting uh, the world of a writer, uh, even the aspects that are the most fictional, uh, particularly uh, the world of a poet, uh, is not a pure construction of the mind uh, she is uh, putting forth here. Uh, the energy uh, that is brought to the creation of work, uh, of the work, uh, the, the artistic work, and the content of the oeuvre come from experiences and life um, that may be even from some souvenirs that are vehicled uh, from, <laughs> that are transported through our genes. Um, I cannot separate the events that make up my everyday life from what I write and paint. Um, and okay, she goes I'm, I'm on Zoom, so the dialectical uh, yeah. relationship between the life of a person and, uh, and the work. Um, uh, the first influences the second, uh, and there is a va et vient a back and forth uh, uh, between uh, life and uh, work. Uh, so uh, I am quite fascinated in this. I, with this, I work with autobiographical works quite a bit in my literary uh, uh, focus. Uh, so uh, here's a, a work um, by Ataladnan with Ataladnan. Adnan, of course, we see the image of Etel Adnan on this uh, cover here, and then, of course, an image by Etel Adnan in, in the background. Interesting how the French title here has a slightly different image, uh, but uh, very similar, of course, uh, to that uh, in the English title here. And uh, I kind of love this slight décalage that we have here. Just uh, uh, here she's looking down at her work, of course, and here she's looking straight at the camera. And and uh, even just this slightly different, and we could of course theorize this uh, and have great fun with it, uh, but a beautiful cover um, to, uh, to this work. Um, La vie est un tissage, so life is a weaving, uh, the title of that work um, was the title of uh, an exposition uh, that took place uh, here. Um, as we can see here in this uh, sort of uh, uh, advertisement for it in 2018. And uh, the gallery uh, showcasing her work here uh, is um, uh, one where she has showcased her work quite a bit um, and has worked with on these publications as well. Um, and uh, that is the Galerie Le Long here, uh, which exists in Paris as well as in New York, uh, Galerie Le Long et Compagnie. Uh, so um, life is a weaving here. Um, uh, beautiful uh, exposition here of her work in Paris. And, um, and here she is again uh, in this conversation with an interviewer uh, who made a film of this interview, uh, Hans Ulrich Obrist, and uh, we see her working on or displaying here at least uh, several of her works uh, and uh, discussing the fact that painting is finished and you know it's finished, uh, like when you know a conversation is finished. Uh, and, uh, you know, just beautiful comments throughout all of these various interviews uh, that took place uh, uh, in the past couple of decades. Um, and uh, this interviewer is quite interested in the Leporello, uh, where, as he says, and you can see his comments below here, you bring together painting and writing. And so we see her flipping through one of these uh, creations. Uh, here is another image uh, of one of these um, leporellos, 
and uh, and yet another and so uh, they're appearing frequently I was in uh, Aix-en-Provence this last summer and a huge uh, poster uh, that you see on the left here was featured in a prominent location in that beautiful, beautiful city. And you can see that this just was wrapped up uh, earlier uh, this month, um, this special exposition uh, at the Museum of Tapestries in Aix-en-Provence and uh, the works of Etel uh, were really, really highlighted here. And a variety of her works uh, were shown. So from the leporettos to uh, tapestries uh, to uh, paintings and uh, quite interesting as well, um, uh, images here uh, of photographs from uh, the Arab apocalypse, uh, an opera which premiered in Arles, so in the south of France uh, um, last year. And so, it, and it was based on an eponymous text uh, by Etta Ladnan. So such uh, influence is really, really remarkable uh, that she has had, um, especially over the past uh, few decades. Um, and um, I wanted, as I was there, you know, <laughs> in Aix-en-Provence, I'm looking, uh, hiking in this vicinity of the Montagne Sainte-Victoire, uh, this very famous uh, uh, mountain that was painted so uh, readily by Cézanne. And uh, here we have uh, at Ladnan, uh, uh, writing, uh, titling this uh, depiction uh, Montagne Sainte Victoire uh, too. Uh, and this leads nicely into her uh, great passion for a mountain in California. Uh, and this is Tamal Pais um, and uh, quote by Etta, mountains are beings. And we see uh, this particular image from 1989 um, and uh, uh, this uh, is also the mountain that is figuring here, another exhibition, uh, more images being uh, displayed and shown at the Lednan, the weight of the world, uh, this in uh, Great Britain, um, and here another image of uh, Mount uh, Tamalpais, uh, and another. And uh, here she is um, in the foreground uh, with the mountain in the back and a quote uh, from yet another <laughs> uh, audio visual uh, representation of her and her work. I never felt alone. I never felt in exile. It really, it was really this mountain that was my point of reference and uh, uh, such a beautiful variety of depictions of this mountain uh, that provides, uh, provided such an anchoring for her physically. It was a, a point of reference that she could refer to in California as she's moving around, uh, you know, even her day, um, uh, but also of course that remained with her when she left uh, uh, this particular geographical location because it was so, so much a part of her. Um, and and she has wonderful you know, reflections on the fact that the mountain is never two minutes the same. So uh, somewhat akin to the previous comments on a human being is never exactly just one thing. Uh, of course, the mountain, everything changes as the light changes uh, and everything else. Um, I love this piece by Simone Fatal um, on perception uh, devoted to Atelanan's uh, visual art. Um, I'd love to read a bit from it because I find these passages is just so profoundly compelling. The first time I saw Etta Ladnan's visual work was in a series of long Japanese folding books in which she had handwritten poetry with accompanying visual equivalents. Through this form, Adnan had quietly effected a revolution in Arabic calligraphy. She had written out poems by the major contemporary Arab poets, each in a unique way using her own handwriting, not trying to conform to the canons of calligraphy, and had accompanied them with drawings, watercolors, ink, and pen work. The books unfolded in front of my eyes as readings of poetry, taking place in the parallel world of color and sensory perception. The poems were brought to life more rapidly than if one followed the words alone. The tenderness of her line brought an immense emotion and empathy to the text and its reading, so that the moment of this reading became intensely present in the imagination. The drawings and watercolors added a dimension of poignancy and urgency to the text, which was seen by Adnan twice, once as a text and once as an image. The reader was thus given three interpretations, that of the poet, the transcriber, 
and the painter. Uh, I invited her to paint in my studio whenever her work at the newspaper left her some free time. She would come on the weekends and work. Uh, all the shyness had disappeared. Etta Lennon in oil had an assuredness uh, rarely seen in other painters' works. The world was summoned and summarized on the canvas. And uh, she discusses uh, the two uh, first canvases that were painted entitled Syria and Lebanon, the colors that are there, uh, the sky, and says, Ednan once said, it is not because painting is visual that it is always comprehensible. The visual is a language one has to learn the way one learns French or Spanish or German. Adnan went on painting, all the while writing notes on her experience and on perception. After her beginning as an abstract colorist, she turned her attention to Mount Tamil Pais. There in front of her window, everywhere in Marin County, where she was living, walking to Dominican from home or driving to go to the movies, the mountain was there. It became her point of reference, her home far from home. She looked at and lived with the mountain even after she came back to Beirut. All the time she was painting the mountain, drawing it in oil, watercolor, ink, or a combination of all. She made thousands of these drawings. The natural pyramidal shape of the mountain became embedded in her whole being. It became her identity. She could draw it while in Lebanon at night or at dawn. The mountain was for her the ever reveling mystery, the ongoing manifestation. I wonder whether in those days she loved someone as much as she loved Mount Tamalpais. And uh, finally, uh, from this piece, Adnan is a colorist. Les coloristes sont des poètes épiques. Colorists are epic poets, says Baudelaire. Uh, who better than Adnan to be in that position, as she is already an epic poet in words. There is an epic vision and rendering in these extraordinary canvases. She is tackling the world, wrestling with it, with love and passion. She told me once, when I die, the universe will have lost its best friend, someone who loved it with passion. She is in love with the beauty of it, she has a need to see color and not at all to use the crayon as pen. I started using oil pastels on their side as bands of color, surfaces of color. Color contains its own mystery. And here we have just a, a write up from 2014 uh, on uh, some exhibitions uh, in New York at the time um, that are receiving attention from uh, the New York Times. Uh, this author, Karen Rosenberg says, in her untitled nearly abstract paintings, the mountain seems to change shape almost as often as Ms. Adnan switches up her palette. Uh, the only cons constant is Ms. Adnan's uh, precise movement of the palette knife, which gives uniform areas to color of color some topographical interest. Uh, and then mentions the, the Leporellos as well. In these shows, Ms. Adnan's complex relationships to landscape and abstraction can be explored at length and without the distractions in another presentation. We come to see Mount Tamalpais as both a specific landmark that offers reassurance to a nomadic artist once exiled from her home country of Lebanon and a universal idea of a mountain upon which memories of different cultures can be projected. And then uh, a more recent uh, uh, piece from uh, the New York Times uh, evokes her quote, bittersweet arrival at the Guggenheim, which happened uh, after her death um, and, uh, and talks about uh, this uh, real emphasis uh, at the end of Etta Ladman's life uh, in a number of uh, places um, very prestigious to the art world um, that have really recognized her work. Uh, so an interesting piece uh, to examine there. And here's one of the pieces featured uh, there uh, at the Guggenheim, Mount Tamal Pais, uh, wool tapestry, um, a deep connection to Northern California and nature to perception. 
Um, in another setting, yet another, um, this is uh, the uh, catalog from the Cezanne uh, exhibit, which has just closed in the Art Institute of Chicago, um, to which uh, there were contributions from uh, the writings of Etta Ladnan, including this email from June 19, uh, 2020, uh, in which she's writing on Cezanne in just uh, really, really revealing and in deep terms. Of all my experiences of Cézanne's works, the most haunting have been his portraits of the gardener, Vallier. Of course, the Mount Saint-Victoire paintings and watercolors have occupied my mind for years, but the epiphany came with the gardener's portraits. This is a simple man, uh, and it's a form of a uh, self-portrait, in a sense, in her reading. Um, the gardener is Cézanne's ultimate mountain uh, in her analysis here. Um, uh, very, very beautiful analysis. Uh, I'm gonna end on just three really quick slides here. I don't wanna take any more time. Uh, of course, there's so much to say, but uh, this is a, a beautiful text by Etta Adnan, Paris When It's Naked. She wrote this one in English. Um, and she did write according to how things moved her, of course, English seems anathema to a text set very much in Paris, uh, contemplating Paris, uh, but she wanted to do that and explains in our interview uh, how purposeful that was. Um, but this is a, a quote from this. But when my papers will get properly stamped, I, the stranger who at times is more French than the French, will go to the corner brasserie and instead of ordering a late lunch, will ask for a grand café au lait taking time off. I may look at the sky once or twice, speaking its own perfect French. I'll address the weather. It's good to have one's papers in order, I'll say, not to be obliged to leave, to have a whole year without fearing the police and before starting to worry about the possibilities of falling ill and the bills that will have to be paid. It's good to feel, even if it lasts only an hour, a long stretch of time, following the cafe au lait. Good to look again at the sky, at the little blue that appears in it, to feel secure, or to say it truly, eternal. And this is another text uh, in the heart of the heart of the country. And I noticed that Amiel, uh, who is among us, uh, has uh, a blurb on the back of, of this particular beautiful publication. Um, another quote, to stop at the gas station and fill up the tank, to go uphill, peak at Mount Tamalpais, uh, to take a rest, breathe, contemplate, to find a path and walk on wet grounds, to enjoy the enormous variety of the shades of green on the mountain, to raise one's eyes to the sky and bring them back to the horizon and compare the different grays of the sky, to try to speak to the clouds, to say, yes, it's impossible, to linger on the mystery of communication, to bemoan its absence, to say it's okay, then not to believe oneself to think of the morning news, to be horrified, to despise, to hate, to empty one's head of overflowing emotions, to regret that evil exists, to blame oneself for the existence of evil, to want to forget about it and not be capable of doing so, to wrap oneself with death. And finally, again from La Vie et Fantissage, this, uh, uh, striking text. Uh, these dates are my points of reference. They are my milestones. Uh, I think of these dates because they help me to put a bit of order in my thoughts. Uh, they work as downbeats in uh, a musical score. Uh, they support memory. In on this date, uh, summer of 1966, uh, I finally went to Egypt uh, and uh, this extraordinary stay uh, was my visit, was marked by my visit to Harania. From Harania to Paris, the path was long. It was sinuous, it was unpredictable, and luckily it was happy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. That was really moving. Um, I just want to encourage everybody to um, put your comments and questions in the chat as they come up. Um, if you are so inspired or you hear something that uh, makes you think about um, question that you have, 
Um, and now we're going to move on uh, to uh, Joanna and Khalil. Um, okay. <laughs> So it's uh, it's difficult to uh, to talk about it then because we will have so much to say. But um, uh, we didn't have a long distance uh, relation. Uh, fortunately, we were able to spend a lot of time together uh, because we are based between Beirut and Paris. So uh, we could uh, we could spend a lot of time with her, uh, and uh, it's so precious. Uh, it's precious time with that, uh, and we we. Uh, we did a lot of recordings of her because she would love to to talk to the camera and also to talk about so many subjects. And uh, not to I, talk to the camera, actually, it was to an, talk with us to take a was, pretext <laughs> for a conversation. Yeah. Everything was a pretext for a very long conversation, and uh, and we would jump from a subject to another, and uh, and this is very particular with the tell the jumping uh, so from so many conversations we had that uh, were interrupted and then we will take them back. And, but I just wanted to say that when we met, uh, we had something in common together and that was really important for both of us. And we'll explain a, a bit the relation that Etel had with languages also, because Etel was, uh, of course, you know a bit about her biography, but she was born uh, from a Greek mother and uh, a Syrian father both were uh, had uh, had to leave uh, Syria and uh, and Turkey and to come to Beirut. And even when uh, Etel was born in Beirut, her mother uh, was uh, very nostalgic of her lost paradise that was uh, Izmir, Izmir, Izmirna for us Greek at that time. And I had the same story with my grandfather because my grandfather was. Uh, uh, had to leave Izmir uh, where he wa when he was 12. And uh, we were in the house, we were like living uh, still in that place. So when we met Etel, uh, we immediately had this idea that we will go together to Izmir. And we will do this trip because uh, she had never went, uh, went back and uh, no, no one of my family also went back. And so uh, we started talking a lot about those places that are part of our imaginary, but we, that we don't have really images. And how do we visualize it? It's of course poet poetic places for us, but also those places has a very specific relation in our mind and in our um, in, in the way I think we 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 got this impression of exile, like Alison was uh, reading some of those uh, those ideas, and also the the, the relation to language. Uh, Etel was um, a poet that was writing in French and in English, and but she didn't have access to this language Arabic that uh, was very important for her. And I think part of the way, the, the reason why she did those leporellos uh, was also because she couldn't uh, write directly in Arabic. So she would pay a tribute to the Arabic poets by re- uh, of, we, uh, I think uh, it's not. It was not copying. Copying. It was uh, drawings of their own poetry, and she would send those leporello to those poets all over the Arab world uh, without knowing them. And I feel it's so incredible that she started doing this as a practice, sending like a letter to them and to uh, to the way they would uh, write poetry. And she told me several times that her major contribution. Uh, to the art world, where those leporellos, and uh, this was just a small because language and the fact that we were in a way far from some language is very important, uh, especially when you're a poet. So this was something that we would talk a lot about. To go back to also another relation that at the beginning, to be honest, uh, I, I loved her poetry, but I was not understanding her painting in the same way. It took me a, 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 a while being also an artist to understand her relation. And it's, it's just when I start to, to realize the joy that was in the encounter of two colors of uh, 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 the surprise that it was creating. And this relation of joy 
is central in all the ways that she was dealing with the world and the real. She was, uh, she was a very curious person. She starts all our conversation by saying, in French, she was saying, c'est curieux, non. It's curious, no. It's and, strange, no. Like, <laughs> And this no means already a kind of community she was creating, meaning she was trying to share with you the same relation of being astonished, being rediscovering the world like if it was for the first time. This was something incredible that keep um, a certain use to all the relation to the world. Because it, we, now here we are talking about images. Uh, it's we are filmmaker and artist. We we don't have this relation that she had to to painting and to colors, but she would explain to us a lot the relation to colors. We would come to her place and and talk a lot with Simone and with her and about for, for example at uh, last year of her life she she wrote and thought about the red the red red. And it was uh, we, uh, because she was uh, working on Cezanne, so uh, she rediscovered another relation to red. And I invite you to to read what she she wrote because it's really incredible. But also, what was really very for us uh, a, a real lesson that Etel will always paint what she sees from her window in a way. So she painted uh, Mont Talma, Ta, Tamal Pais because it was like you said, Alison here, present all the time. Even if it, she's not in front of it. Even if she's not in front of it. And, at the, uh, and uh, she would paint what is on her table, on her desk. Uh, she would, at the, uh, at the end, she would pa paint a lot or draw a lot what is on her desk. So the ink, uh, a, a fruit, mushrooms that Simone uh, used to uh, did, did in ceramics. And, uh, and we were very surprised because Sometimes she wouldn't put colors, just black and white at the end. As is colors, she, she would rediscover or renegotiate her relation with colors all the time. And uh, this it was very moving to see her always searching. And, and Etel will always tell us that she would do uh, a painting. She will never stop until she finished. She finishes, but she will never rework on a painting. And this also, it's like another way to relate to painting and, and colors. And we started by telling you that uh, when we went, uh, when we, we met, uh, we had this uh, obsession, both of us with the city, Izmir, because our parents and grandparents were obsessed by it, but we didn't have images. So we, we took it as a mission to go and bring images to Etel because she couldn't come with us anymore. And so uh, I just want to show you a small extract of what she said about uh, transmission, images, history, and all this. I'm going to share my screen just a minute. La seule chose qui reste, c'est la transmission orale. Si tu l'enlèves, il reste elle. Ton grand-père a dit, parce qu'il n'y a pas de lettres, regardez, il n'y a pas d'archives, il n'y a pas de Il n'y a rien, ce fameux grand-père. Qu'est-ce que son fils a raconté à son fils? Donc, raconter chez nous était presque survivre. Quand on me dit Zmir, je n'ai pas vu Zmir, mais ce n'est pas vide non plus, je ne sais pas ce que c'est. Ça, ça, ça réveille quelque chose. Quand, quand ma mère me dit qu'il y avait des voitures à chevaux, le harama, non, je n'ai jamais vu. On ne reconstitue et on croit qu'il y a une magie qui se passe. Quand tu fais de la photo et le soleil imprime et fait, il doit y avoir des impressions magnétiques transmises. Et ça prend tout de suite forme de pareil. 
dans la misère. Parce qu'il y a un mythe qui se fait, et même dans chaque So it's um, the film, we, we talk a lot in the film about the, the absent image, the image that we don't have anymore. And I think that uh, a lot of, uh, of this uh, relation that we have when we are artists is trying to bring back some images from the past or to reproduce what we have in front of us, but always with this idea of we are full of those missing images also. And um, I just want to end by saying uh, that um, with two things, just a personal uh, thing that happened to us uh, with Etel. Etel would always uh, ha uh, know how to, to, to be more curious about other than uh, than about herself, always asking many questions. And um, once she said uh, to us, uh, we had like, uh, we, we had very difficult times after in Lebanon, there was a terrible explosion and she would be very affected by this, but Khalil and me, we lost our apartment, our studio, and we, it was very difficult for us to come back. And suddenly one day she would tell me, you know, you have to do tapestries. And I said, no. Etal, I don't do tapestries, you see, I, I'm a visual artist. And she said, no, no, you have to do tapestries. And she would bring her uh, wool and show me how, she, uh, and, and always talking with me uh, and Khalil about tapestries. And, uh, and we didn't really understand why. And uh, after, after she left, um, we, we had an opportunity to work on tapestry. It was very strange. And so we started working uh, without really knowing, but thinking a lot of her saying like, maybe we can do this as, as a tribute to, uh, to, uh, to her. And because tapestry takes a lot of time and we had to work a lot with, you know, finding the colors, the right uh, wools, uh, all this, uh, it was a very restorative moment. And so she gave us this possibility to think with, with to heal. doing and to heal with doing this tapestry, thinking of her and taking the time to heal also. Something I would like to add uh, as a conclusion, something uh, in the end. Um, we went to uh, uh, at, uh, the last time we saw her was in Erki and she gave us a painting. It is bizarre, she was painting also the view from her it's in Brittany, so there is a her tea window. And, mm. and something very strange happened is that the colors, because she was she was uh, using more kind of feutre <coughs> of colors, and little by little, after she, uh, um, the colors start to disappear. So today, little the the image. Has she, less color than when she gave us gave us. So it's like a, it to the, if it, it it took also the colors with her. Little by little, we feel that some color are disappearing because they don't want to to leave her in a way. They follow her. I have here a, a poems, but maybe if we have time, said by Etel, we will listen to a minute or two if you want. Yeah, yeah, we 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 definitely have time. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just uh, felt that it would be really interesting to hear her voice saying a poem. I hope you will hear it well. Can you hear it? Sorry. Where are um, we? Where? There is a way because we are suffering and help you. And who are we? It's not you and me. Where are we? Out of history, of his or her story, and back into it, out in space and back to earth, out of the womb and then into dust. Who are we? Where is where? Where is 
terror, the love, the pain, where the hatred, where is your life and mine? There is a way connected to telephone line, a place for waking, another for sleeping, a kiss and a flower, and where are we when you are, and where are you when I wait for you to be, to be the people I see. Who are we? A race, a tribe, a herd, a passing phenomenon, or a traveler keep traveling in order to find out who we are and who we shall be. Are we traveling on a rope? Is cancer eating our neighbor? Where the sun when night descends, and where paradise on the ocean asphalt road? Yeah, <laughs> it's longer, but. I want Amiel to talk, but this is a question I think that where are we <laughs> is, is maybe uh, also why we are together tonight, uh, like talking about her and, uh, and trying to... Uh, to meet virtually in this day. Yes, to meet virtually and share something about her. Thank you so much. I feel like Atel is like hovering in the space with us now. <laughs> yes, for sure. Uh, okay, Amiel, uh, take it away. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, Allison and uh, Joanna and Khalil. That was, yeah, incredibly moving. I will try to keep it together. Uh, so, you know, where are we? I've been thinking a lot about this because, uh, you know, Atel's death is the death of a world, uh, a huge and rich world that it is kind of up to us to somehow continue or, or reshape or transmit or transform. And, you know, the last maybe as one gets older, one sees this generation of elders leave and it is uh, quite devastating, but also very, um, uh, it presses one to think about how to proceed, you know? And I think that in the West, at least, you know, we've become much less independent. We've become much more incorporated the kinds of, the kinds of truly uh, repressive regimes that exist in so many other parts of the world have been internalized. We have our own internal occupation um, that kind of flattens the world, you know, and the digital has certainly helped to flatten the world. And, you know, Etel was anything but flattened. She was vibrant, textural, uh, emotional, intellectual, always all at the same time. And, you know, the, I can't overstate the importance of our relationship, particularly, I think she understood my work better than anyone I have encountered. And she expressed it. I mean, she wrote the blurb to my first book, The Cairo Notebooks, and we were in constant correspondence. And I was very happy to have the opportunity to really write a longer piece that accompanied the two volume uh, Etel Reader. And I'll read you her response to, to that. And I'm really just going to read some excerpts from letters that, uh, from emails and letters. Uh, but I wanna begin with a quote from a very dear common friend, Benjamin Hollander, who died some years ago of brain cancer. And uh, Ben describes the first time he met Etel, and they were just as hit it off. They were talking about poetry and baseball and the Middle East and film and everything <laughs> at once. And uh, Ben writes, it was then I realized what I was to discover over and over about Etel's presence, the reality of it, the directness of it, the warmness of it. As we sat down close and bent over listening to each other, her manner, her bearing, her being right there, the real thing. 
poets that tell once wrote to me are great realists, even when they see angels, if they do, like Rilke. Etel is a realist of ideal integrity whose love for others radiates outward. She gives herself vulnerable permission to simultaneously inhabit and confront a spectrum of emotions in a moment, joy and sadness at the same time, an inner life which shows itself about her person, which is inclusive without question. And one of the great permissions, you know, I, I think of Robert Duncan's poem, often I'm permitted to return to a meadow as if it were a field made up by the mind, uh, a beloved poet of Etel's. And Etel bridged that world of, of the poets I was closest to in the US with the poets I feel closest to in other parts of the world, not just the Middle East, but Europe and other parts of the world. And there were very few people who had that intimacy with that, with all of that, who had that absolute intimacy. And I was so moved by what Joanna said about the Leporellos and, and, and what Simone wrote about, about the, the triple reading of those, how those operated. Um, uh, but that for me was a great permission to find ways to historically, politically, emotionally inhabit all of those worlds without boundaries and, and, and have them meet, have them interact, have them clash. Um, so I wanna kind of start with a later one. This is when I sent to tell my preface, uh, she wrote, Dear Amiel, well, what could I say after reading your preface to my meandering works other than then I wish all this is true, but it's such a straightforward and subtle demonstration that only a friend as profoundly intelligent as you are can have written it. It is as if really things came together in your vision and among many things bring me not only joy, but reassurance. We are lonely writers, which is rather good. And suddenly there is a light that makes us happy. A big thank you, a big hug. Nothing seems enough, but it's there. Uh, and needless to say, that meant so much to me. That response. Um, so, I'll just go through here. Um, of course, you know, the, the, the distances and also news about friends passing away were a constant new work, distance, and friends were, were very, uh, very strong uh, themes that, that and here, here is Etel's response at a time when I was going through some medical issues. She's, writes, Dear Amiel, I did read your letter and was alarmed, not really alarmed, but upset that you went through such bad news. It's just hard on the imagination, then things become normal. I wish I could visit you. We never spent much time together in the same place. My life has been sheer dispersion. But when a friend was particularly dear as you are to me, things have a continuity of their own. God knows how and on what levels. Be well, dear Amiel, take a big breath and let the world be what it be. You do more than your part anyway. Many, many hugs, much love, Etel. And uh, this is a bit in reference to uh, the, the uh, array of, of exhibits and reviews that Allison showed. Uh, Etel wrote to me at one point, I am really exhausted. And the fact that suddenly just before turning the ominous 90, the art galleries behave like the young men when I was 20 is making me exhausted. It's so rewarding, of course, but I don't really know what to say besides sometimes saying simply, I can't. I rather think beyond this every day. I think of you so often with such closeness to your work, which is one approach to your soul among many, that it's a heartbreak that we never lived close. One of these things, and time running in the street. Much, much, much love, Etel. This time running in the street is such a perfect Etel expression. It's so original and so unusual and so beautiful. Um, uh, here is, I don't know if you can see this. I sent her a picture of Amiri, beautiful picture of Amiri Baraka when he passed and uh, Dear Amiel, what a picture of Amiri. He looks so vulnerable, so beautiful, so full of soul. As you say, we will celebrate his life. He gave us support. Um, 
and then uh, this was when uh, our friend Benjamin died, who I, I quoted. Dear Amiel, this evening, Simone said, Amiel phoned twice. And I said, Benjamin died? And she said, didn't you know? It's already a few days ago. I had hoped he would live a bit longer, but his doctors were right. I'm in tears, nothing else we can do. I was so happy you and Norma gave him so much support, kept close in his courageous last months. We had a great human being in him. We were comforted by that. He's one of the few who gave us faith in being human, who gave us light, like keeping the window open. That sense of uh, the particularity of a person that Attell could express unabashedly was so empowering, you know, was so uh, empowering. It gave one such a sense of vitality and life and purpose. Um, uh, this is further on Ben. Dear Amiel, thanks for sending your phone number. It's the one I already have, no change. Your words, your poem on Ben moved me deeply, deeply. You're the one to have spoken to him for the last. I still hear his voice, the friendliness and ur the urgency in that voice, always waiting for something. He had such a presence, a presence that will survive him. We're in a season of holidays. After all, a new year. Keep hoping this one will be better everywhere. Much, much love, Etel. Uh, and then there was the news of Joanne Kiger's death, uh, also very different they were. Still, they both had an enormous intellect and spirituality that had also to do with their profound commitment to speak for the sufferings in the world. It's good you sent me a word. Some of us need each other. And then uh, lastly, um, this was from 2014 after the attacks on Gaza. I had written a poem called Letter to the Americans. And uh, dear Amiel, this is a tell. Of course, she always used Simone's email. So she had to say, this is a tell uh, because she would see Simone's, Simone's email. Um, a long time since I want to say hello to you, unfortunately from so far, but things to tell like Khaled's visit, he who enchanted both Simone and me, but above all, how to say it, for it makes me cry, to say how much your poem during the last Gaza days goes beyond poems, in the deep heart of poetry, in the heart of human sorrow, renewed throughout centuries, and here you feel it and say it, and I wanted you to know what I'm telling you. Much, much love, Etel. This is another incredible expression. I wanted you to know what I'm telling you. That is so emphatic and so uh, poetic and so beautiful. So um, yeah, I think I will just end with that. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for all of you. That was so moving um, and evocative. Um, I have questions, but I'd like to open it up to the audience first um, to see if anyone has uh, any comments or stories or questions or yeah, anything you'd like to open up. We'd really like to hear from you. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand uh, or just come off of mute and speak. Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, while um, people are thinking, I think I'll just start. Um, I think one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is how much Atel has influenced so many people that I know, their work. Um, and their approach to work. Um, and I think also kind of in the spirit of what all of you presented, thinking about Atel as like a, an interlocutor and a, um, and a shaper of work um, and a kind of force of nature in the art world. Um, I was hoping maybe each of you could talk a little bit about how, why, 
I mean, how she shaped your own work and why you think, what, what was it about her that made her such an incredible um, conversationalist and interlocutor with artists and, and poets? Uh, if I jump in, I would say uh, courage to be herself. Uh, simply put, courage to be herself and to express herself and her curiosity, as Khalil beautifully described. Um, and a, just a, a pure vibrancy. I mean, one of the things I, I wrote in my preface was that a poet's job is attention. Attell was attentive to everything, you know, things around her, sounds, smells, people, feelings. Uh, she was very attentive and very responsive. And that, that uh, is a, it's a very rare, quality to, and also with the gifts that she had to then propel those into the world is a very rare thing. I would say there is uh, something else that uh, we realize especially um, now that it was a way to enchant in the words and our reality, but in the same time being at the core of all the sorrow and the sadness, because she was really aware and engaged politically. So there was this kind of um, empathy to the words and to the suffering of the others, and at the same time a way for um, like oasis in the desert to give us the feeling that she uh, we can we can um, it, yes enchant our word and uh, i think also the fact that uh, uh, like uh, we we evoked uh, all of us in a way etel uh, worked and uh, did her poetry uh, without this relation to uh, to the art world, to the art market, uh, as artists, it's very important. Poetry, also, I I, I suppose the same. Uh, but uh, what inspired me a lot with her was this idea that uh, she would do her work. Okay, she got to be discover discovered, like that say, but she was was uh, always painting and she was always laughing at this idea of discovering her lately but she would always say that it gave me time because they 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 i had time to work without all those emails and people coming and asking for so many things from her like you were reading amiel the fact that she would say i can't and um because she didn't like to say no this is something that i didn't like to do but i think that the curiosity courage courage like to live the way she wanted to live in in a time and in a in a country like Lebanon, where it, is, it was not easy, and uh, and po politics also. She was totally, as Khalil was saying, po uh, attentive to the sorrow and the despair of individuals and collectives and populations, and she will always write about this. And a very specific thing that the way she would look at others, she would, each one of us would feel that we are so special. And it's, uh, and when, uh, when she left us, I, I think at it's everyone felt that not only the universe lost his best friend, but each one of us lost <laughs> a person, a, fr a dear, maybe a really very dear friend to each one of us. She would have this special way of being attentive, of being empathic, and of giving you something. Not only, she would not talk a lot about herself. She was not very interested. She would be attentive to you, totally with you. So you will you would feel special. And this is the way she would look at the world. And this is 
with this curiosity and um, and this is very special in the art world you don't get to 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 achieve uh, she, she was word, and in the words but because you you ask about the artists it's to to be as much uh, there is a permission to to take this term to but also she preserved something very beautiful in her i just wanted to mention i just discovered i thought i remembered there was a thing that i published during the war in bosnia called for Za sarevo and the tell gave me the poem which is what where are we oh okay. so it was first published there yeah 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 it's so. really weird. there's a connection <laughs> yeah <laughs> it all connects us <laughs> but um but the fact to stay very political also, very important and bring complexity, complexity to the world. Because here we, 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 we live in a world that lack complexity more and more. Yeah. She would give complexity. And yet, of course, do so in such what seemed to be lucid speech, lucid prose, lucid poetry. I mean, just uh, it would give an illusion of simplicity at times, I think, uh, but there was such profound um, thought that went into these formulations and these contemplations. And so just a balance that is uh, uh, quite beautiful in my, in my reading and my hearing of her. Um, but this uh, just, I, I think also to add to these wonderful terms and words that we're using, um, something so genuine, you know, and and uh, devoid of any falsification or desire uh, to, uh, you know, self-aggrandizement or anything of that sort. There's just such a genuine nature uh, in that curiosity and that desire to know, to go toward the other, uh, to engage, to exchange. Um, so, uh, so real. And, uh, and yet, as you're saying, such a lucidity about uh, things. So no sort of sugar coating. Uh, this book has such lucidity about it. And uh, uh, even your comments, uh, Amiel, you know, which figure uh, in the blurb on the back, for instance, you know, uh, uh, there's something very, very uh, profoundly concerned, of course, worried. Uh, uh, there's a depth about uh, the reality of our surroundings um, that is acknowledged uh, constantly. And in that quote uh, that I uh, uh, read aloud as well. Um, but also for me, generosity, uh, just such immense generosity, the giving that we keep hearing about. Um, uh, really, really striking to me. Um, uh, as I left, uh, she gave me uh, my own <laughs> uh, version of the mountain and uh, not just one, uh, but two. And <laughs> these have stayed with me and I think I should frame them <laughs> because uh, uh, they're kept very preciously, but yes, I, I, I want them, you know, uh, prominently showcased and, and, and uh, better cared for, but they're in perfect uh, condition from when she gave them to me. But this, let me give to you and, and, uh, and her art and her vision just seems to be such a gift in, in every sense. Um, so very touching to me. I, I wanted to just evoke as well, someone has asked about exile and place and her attachment to place. I think her contemplations of place, her depictions of place uh, are, are so very interesting, like in Paris when it's naked, uh, but also time. And you brought up time, uh, all of you, I think, in, in very specific ways. And her contemplations of time, I ended my interview on that, you know, relationship to time, et cetera, and such amazing things that we could say, I think, on so many levels about uh, her, her thoughts. It's uh, just I want to add that uh, that maybe sorry Amiel. No, go, go 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 ahead, John. What is uh, what she would she what was always very inspiring is to see how she would talk about very profound things, very deep, very uh, complex things, but in an acceptable way, in a simple way. Like uh, and this is uh, I think give a lot to to others when they read her. Uh, there is a different stage where of of, of uh, accessibility also uh, for Etel and and I have also to say that 
for me as a woman coming from Lebanon, from this region, she was a very important uh, model in a way, uh, because of what you say, uh, Amiel, this idea of courage and to choose her life, to, to, to be become an individual in places where uh, communitarism, family uh, is very important and is very heavy uh, patriarchal uh, system. And, uh, and so uh, she was the kind of uh, possibilities, you know, so she opens uh, possibilities uh, for others, to, for us to, to, to be also individuals, to, to be subjects, not only part of uh, something that was, uh, you know, uh, deciding for us. Yeah, it's a, a, exactly what I wanted to say. Allison started and you continued. The, 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 it's such a courageous thing to focus on plain language mm -hmm. and to rely on plain language and to force people to understand the enormity of accrued meanings and possibilities in plain language. We have become so academicized and so theoreticalized that exactly. there are very few tools to handle work like it tells because nobody knows what to do with it. It comes right at you directly, but it's not so simple. You know, it appears to be very straightforward. It isn't. It relies on philosophical, existential, historical, political, you know, emotional, grounds that are very complex but she always comes to very plain language and it's an amazing amazing uh quality of her work and exactly what you say i think it it allows an accessibility that is very direct to people you know they, they respond to her poetry very quickly um i wanted to as as we kind of uh near the end of this and then I wanted to come back to this question that uh, Elena asked. Um, do you think that exile made Etel more or less attached to place? And I thought um, this question also just touches upon another question about just about the relate the gen more general relationship between exile and place uh, that I think is in Etel's work is so unusual and in a way kind of spiritual. Um, and different from, very different in my mind from um, the kind of uh, the way artists thematically often tend to relate the relationship between exile and place. So I was I was wondering if you could, if you know, all of you or some of you could talk a little bit about how you see that. At the core of sorry go 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 ahead At the core of our uh, of our um, conversations there was always uh, to go back to what Amiel was saying about uh, plain language or plain position but they are uh, from the beginning coming from a very complex and sedimented uh, story I meaning uh, her um, um there was so many sedimentation before being saying I'm here and now and knowing that there was Greece, Syria, Turkey, France, uh, um, uh, uh, Lebanon. Le uh, Lebanon, the US, uh, San Francisco, uh, New York, uh, again Greece and all this was to get Italy, very important also, and all this was very fluid and uh, and uh, uh, a total uh, meaning this density of the sedimentation creating something very uh homogenic but you know exactly that is coming from a lot a lot of histories heterogeneous elements that manage to coexist and to give uh an, an incredible um, composition, I would say, but that look very simple, that seems, so I would, uh, it's very complex for me to say exile or not, because it's, um, it's ontological to her way of being, I would say. Because maybe exile is not about places, uh, and I think it's about uh, uh, a way to be in the world, it's about language, and I think this uh, 
you know, uh, you can be uh, in a place that is your country and feel totally in exile with no relation. And you can be not in your country and feel totally connected to the place. So exile and place, I think, it's not always antagonist. You can, it's, it's, uh, it's more the relations that you have to a language, to a history, to a society at a certain moment. See, we feel, for example, sometimes exile in our own country. Uh, so oh, at a certain moment. At a certain moment. It's not only about places. Yeah. yeah. I would also say, I think, um, you know, in some sense, I think Etel would have agreed, you know, outside of the womb, one is already in some kind of ex, some, some other mm -hmm. state. And uh, she made herself at home in the world. As Khalil said, that she was at home in the world. The world was her place. It was her planet. It was her universe. She was cosmic in that sense. She felt a, a, an attachment to the cosmos and she was part of it. It was a oneness, I think, a very sense of being in tune with, with everything and trying to find out how to align herself to certain things, um, I think is how she would have thought of it. Um, and as far as language goes, I, you know, one of her decisions to start writing in English had to do with uh, being in the U.S. and 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 while the you know the liberation of Algeria was going on, she felt she couldn't write in French. And as the anti-Vietnam protests began to rise, she felt attached to the poets who were who were in that movement. And that's when she really began to write poems in English, I, I, as she tells it, at least that that's that's the story I remember. So again, the very, you know, as you both point, very political consciousness and always attuned to what, yeah, what was actually happening to people in the world. This was a, a, a lot, we talked a lot about language because we would, talk in a language, feel in another one, and had our history is linked to a third language. So, uh, and uh, painting had, she, she always relate with, to the fact that painting has no language, not that type of language, of uh, barrier, Geography. sorry, barrier, geographical language, bar yeah. barrier in the language. Because this is an exile also, when you feel that you don't, you're not totally connected to the language that you would love to use, that in her case, maybe would be Arabic also, because of our history, of, current, of our colonization, of all this. Alison, did you want to say anything? I might uh, just thank you, Joanna, for mentioning the Arabic, which she, you know, also uh, uh, discussed with me and, you know, uh, a very painful distance from it that is not unlike that I have heard uh, from those growing up in colonized Algeria who were forbidden to speak Arabic uh, in the French schooling system, who were not given instruction in that language, and, and you know, who have lamented this. Uh, there have been a number of thinkers and writers, and, uh, and you know, this is uh, also a product of, uh, of a certain mindset uh, that has gone with French. So I think it's very important uh, that, um, uh, that there is that lamentation and that you mention, you know, this one regret, perhaps. Uh, um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, the laden history uh, with French and the Algerian war, which she also brought up during our interview. So I think this deep political awareness, uh, uh, again, uh, joy <laughs> in, in the multiplicity and in the multiple languages she uh, she lived in and worked in, uh, but uh, but then certain uh, you know deep awarenesses of, of wrongs that are historical and political. Okay, um, I think we're going to have to wrap up now. Uh, so I just really want to thank um, Joanna, Khalil, Allison, and Amiel. Thank you, Mojtaba. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Uh, for being part of this. And thank you. I also just want to thank Etel for everything that she has brought into this world and given us. And we, we will miss her and her work very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.